committee at any time. Today we'll hold our first hybrid hearing with members appearing in person and remotely and witnesses appearing remotely. Pursuant to the latest guidance from the attending physician, anyone present in the hearing room today must wear a mask covering their, mo their mouth and nose if they are not fully vaccinated. The committee has masks available for any member who needs one. It is my hope that with everyone's cooperation, we can protect the safety of members and staff and their families at home and continue to have more opportunities to work together in person. As a reminder, uh, members participating in the hear hearing remotely should be visible on camera throughout the hearing. Members appearing remotely are responsible for controlling their own microphones and can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Uh, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository to sccc.repository at mail.house.gov. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform the committee staff immediately. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining this hybrid hearing. Today, we'll talk about transportation investments for solving the climate crisis. And I now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, uh, this week, uh, an extraordinary heat wave pummeled the West Coast while heavy rain fell across the central United States. Cable car power lines melted in Portland, halting public transit. A highway flooded in Detroit, stranding drivers. The hazards of the climate crisis on transportation was all too clear. So it's fitting today that our hearing will focus on transportation investments critical for solving the climate crisis. And you know, after World War II, our country and Congress made national infrastructure a priority. A network of roads, bridges, and transit systems connecting businesses and communities coast to coast. And at the time, it was a historic achievement that quite literally transformed our economy and the way we live. But that infrastructure no longer meets the challenges of today and the needs of the 21st century. More than 40% of our public roadways today are in poor or mediocre condition, and more than 46,000 bridges across America are structurally deficient. Motorists are spending nearly $130 billion a year on extra repairs and costs, and they're forced to drive on deteriorating roads. Not only are roads and bridges in disrepair, our transportation sector is making these problems worse. The transportation sector is the top source of carbon pollution in the United States, accounting for nearly a third of all emissions in our country in 2019. Ironically, our transportation infrastructure is both vulnerable to the impacts of climate change while contributing to its causes. We face another historic moment in our history. Uh, will we continue the failing status quo? or once again transform and improve the way we live our lives? I think the answer is clear. We must respond with generational investments to help communities adapt and become more resilient to the challenges of, climate, of the climate crisis. At the same time that we modernize our transportation systems to cut carbon pollution and create new family sustaining jobs. That means expanding manufacturing of American made low and zero emission vehicles. It means investing in a national network of chargers to make electric vehicles a reality for millions of Americans. It means investing in public transit and redesigning roads that are safe for walking and biking. And we must not repeat the mistakes and injustices of the past. Communities of color and low-income communities suffer the consequences of climate disruptions disproportionately. When extreme weather hits, the harshest impacts are felt by Americans who have limited access to transportation and other essential community services, or who are already facing economic hardship. What's worse, the same Americans already face harsher climate risks, including the negative health outcomes associated with poor air quality. And in many cases, they're the same Americans whose communities were divided as highways were paved right through their neighborhoods. That's why, as we invest in 21st century infrastructure, we must center environmental justice. We must heal the harms of the past, using this opportunity to elevate historically excluded communities. 
But thankfully, we have solutions at hand. The Invest in America Act, which the House is debating today, takes important steps to clean up our transportation sector, including investing more than $8 billion in highway, transit, and rail projects that will reduce carbon pollution. It also invests in programs to mitigate the threats posed by extreme weather before disaster strike, and it will expand clean transportation choices for millions of Americans. It's all part of President Biden's vision for solving the climate crisis, which he outlined earlier this year in the American Jobs Plan. As a major pillar of the plan, President Biden has called on Congress to make a historic investment in world-class transportation infrastructure as we also ensure justice for vulnerable Americans and lead America to our clean energy future. Today, we'll discuss how we can use this historic opportunity to modernize the transportation sector in a way that reduces pollution, builds resilience, centers environmental justice, and strengthens our economy. So I look forward to our discussion. At this time, the chair now recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Graves of Louisiana, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Madam Chair, I want to apologize for being tardy today. Mr. Uh, Palmer told me the hearing started at 135, and he apparently told Mr. Armstrong it started at 140. So uh, um, I, I apologize for that. Um, I, seriously, great to, great to be here today. And this is a really important topic, and uh, good to see some of the witnesses, including a uh, fellow Louisianian and uh, former co-worker, Ms. Osborne. Good to see you today and looking forward to hearing from, from you. Uh, Madam Chair, as you noted in your opening statement, um, the, the extraordinary progress that we've made in the energy sector in terms of reducing emissions and keeping costs down um, and, and continuing to, to largely meet the need of, of U.S. energy demand, uh, it's been extraordinary within the power sector. And as a matter of fact, as a result of some of the efforts that have taken place in the power sector, um, the United States is leading the world in reducing emissions, and as we've discussed here on, on numerous occasions, we've reduced emissions in the power sector in the United States more than the next 12 emissions reducing countries combined. And I do believe as we move forward, we have uh, much opportunity in the transportation sector to see some, some, some uh, important and, and uh, great successes. As a matter of fact, I, I want to thank Chairman DeFazio and the transportation bill that's under consideration on the floor um, just this week. I know something that uh, my friend Mr. Huffman's really excited about, a provision that's in that bill that, um, that, that actually uh, revolutionizes transportation planning by taking anonymous and aggregate data um, from perhaps companies like Uber and other TNCs and companies like uh, Waze and, and Google, which are the same thing, and, and taking aggregate data, looking at folks, uh, where folks are originating uh, their, their uh, routes and where they're uh, destined to, where they're trying to get to, and, and figuring out instead of just laying that rubber hose down on roads and, and saying, hey, we need a new lane here, more capacity, and just laying more concrete or asphalt and adding more roads instead, let me say it again, revolutionizing transportation planning by saying, how, where are people trying to start their destination? Where are they trying to end it? And let's build roads in those places, trying to more efficiently connect people where you get lower emissions, you get greater fuel efficiency, and you get significantly less miles driven. Um, so... Mr. Huffman, I know you, you, you're a big supporter of that. Another opportunity in the transportation sector that is being advanced under the legislation under consideration on the House floor is one that would do a better job trying to uh, communicate to, to, to ITS systems and traffic lights that, that let the lights know how many cars are coming in different directions. That way you can begin setting proportional red and green lights and arrows and things like that. That way you don't have all the stopping and starting of cars, which is where you have the greatest emissions is in that uh, acceleration process. So, so look, I, I, I know that the main focus has been on electrifying our vehicles and moving to, um, moving to EVs, which, which clearly, uh, long term is an important part of, of a lower emission strategy, but there are other technologies that we must keep in play because I do think when you look at the existing state of technology and the performance of these vehicles, you've got some big challenges. Look, uh, Ms. Osborne and I are from South Louisiana, and, and as you know, you've got a lot of uh, trucks pulling boats around, going to the fishing in the Gulf of Mexico, and the, and the current capabilities of EVs pulling a load like that, you can, you can get in your new electric vehicle and you can drive your boat pulling it both miles and then you can get back out and charge it again and, and get moving. In fact, um, not just the, the lack of capacity or power density, even though that has improved in recent years for electric vehicles, but 
the amount of time it's going to take to charge, even a fast charge, when you have it. And there are only 4,000 uh, charging stations around the country today that have the full um, uh, uh, capacity to do the full quick charge, I, I believe you're still looking at 45 minutes. Well, consumers aren't going to accept lower, and I was, I was being a little dramatic on my two miles. I've driven pulling a boat, but it's significantly less than a, 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 a gasoline vehicle today. The, the performance comparison is not going to be accepted by consumers. So we must continue innovating and continue looking at other options like fuel cell vehicles. When this plays out, we've got to make sure that we're looking from A to Z at the energy supply chain, looking at the fact that you're going to have to have rare earths and strategic minerals, looking at the fact that you're going to have more impacts on roads. For example, just the battery set for the new Hummer is 2,500 pounds, which according to my math, which Mr. Huffman's going to correct me on, is around 14 additional passengers. That's the equivalent, 14 additional passengers, which then puts more impact on roads because of the weight of the vehicles. How are we going to address all of these issues looking holistically, supply chain, not having China steal our intellectual property, making sure that we have performance that is comparable to existing combustion engines and other uh, factors that, that must be considered end to end to ensure we're truly moving in the right direction that's acceptable to consumers and keeps the trajectory of lower emissions. Um, so Madam Chair, thank you. I appreciate you having this hearing. Looking forward to witness testimony. Yield back. Without objection, members who wish to enter opening statements into the record may have five business days to do so. Now I would like to welcome our witnesses. We will hear from a panel of experts and practitioners about how investments in transportation infrastructure can curb harmful pollution, increase climate resilience, redress historical inequities, and increase quality of life in our communities. First, the Honorable Margaret Anderson Kelleher is the Commissioner of the Minnesota uh, Department of Transportation. She previously served in the Minnesota House of Representatives for 12 years, including four years as speaker, and has served as pr the president of the Minnesota High Tech Association and chair of the governor's broadband task force. Mr. Bill Van Amberg is the executive vice president of CalStart, a national nonprofit focused on accelerating clean transportation. Mr. Van Amberg leads CalStart's initiative on medium and heavy-duty trucks and off-road equipment. His teams operate projects in multiple states and with the U.S. Army. Mr. Robert Bryce is a visiting fellow at the Foundation for Research on Equal Opportunity and a Texas-based author, journalist, podcaster, film producer, and public speaker. He spent 12 years as a reporter for the Austin Chronicle and was the managing editor of the Houston-based Energy Tribune from 2010 to 2019. He was a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Ms. Beth Osborne is the Director of Transportation for America, where she leads an alliance of leaders from across the country working to ensure that states and the federal government invest in smart, homegrown transportation solutions. She previously served as the Acting Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. With that, Commissioner Anderson Kelleher, you are now recognized to give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Castor, ranking member, Gra ranking member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding transportation and climate effects in Minnesota. My name is Margaret Anderson Kelleher, and I'm honored to serve as the Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Climate change is already impacting Minnesota. From our people, wildlife, plants, to waters, historic resources, outdoor recreation areas, and our infrastructure. Minnesota is getting warmer and wetter. Average temperatures in Minnesota have increased by nearly three degrees Fahrenheit statewide. Warmer temperatures mean more maintenance costs, more dangerous ice on our roads, less time to transport heavy loads during the winter months. Extreme heat events are also a major concern and problem. This year alone, we saw over 43 incidents of pavement buckling or exploding due to extreme heat already. Minnesota is experiencing more damaging rains, 65% increase in the number of three inch rain events and mega rain events, which are more than six inches are four times more frequent in, than the prior three decades. Heavy precipitation creates many challenges, 
and can literally wash away our roads and bridges or result in increased debris flow that causes bridges and culverts to fail. We also know that climate change does not impact all communities equally. Low income people, who often those who are black, indigenous and people of color are the most likely to be negatively impacted despite contributing the least amount of carbon pollution MnDOT has dedicated resources to understanding the current and future climate change in our state. And we are working to make our system more resilient in a way that centers on equity and public health. In particular, we are working to develop a statewide extreme flood vulnerability analysis tool to improve local downscale data for evaluating future flood risks to our bridges, large culverts and pipes. This helps make us helps us to make better data informed decisions about projects based on the likelihood and magnitude of climate risks and seriousness of factors such as traffic volumes, evacuation routes, access to medical services, freight needs and detour links. State departments of transportation are the primary agencies responsible for transportation planning and programming. We believe it's our responsibility to lead in reducing carbon pollution from transportation. Like the United States as a whole, transportation is the number one source of carbon pollution in Minnesota. In 2017, MnDOT adopted greenhouse gas emission reduction goals for transpor the transportation sector to align with statewide carbon and gas greenhouse gas emission goal reduction. In 2019 and 2020, our MnDOT Pathways to Decarbonizing Transportation Project and our Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council engaged in public, engaged with the public, private, nonprofit, and citizen leaders and businesses to identify and Im implement strategies to reduce carbon pollution. We believe that long-term ongoing partnerships between the public and private sector can be a model to help avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. Today, MnDOT is leading the way on several initiatives, including setting a goal to reduce vehicle miles traveled, promoting, promoting electric vehicles and EV charging, reevaluating our approach to congestion management, and deprioritizing lane capacity, which both induces demand and causes new co can cause new co costs to a woefully underfunded system. Minnesota is not on current on track to achieve our greenhouse gas emission goals. MnDOT is working hard to change that, but federal support and partnership is needed, which is why we are encouraged by the proposals in the Invest America Act proposed by the House. In 2016, we led a multi-state effort to encourage Federal Highway Administration to modernize performance measures. We are encouraged to see similar reporting considered now and encouraged to see federal technical and financial support for states who do this as a new task. We recommend financial incentives rather than penalties for states that can develop the capacity. The pro proposed new pre-disaster mitigation program would go a long way to help modernize federal climate risk standards. We also encourage regular updates to historical data in Atlas 14 and federal estimates of future climate data we also need improved data and tools beyond Atlas 14 that are downscaled and consistently updated and actionable. Of course, electric vehicle charging and infrastructure is critical as well. And we also support urging the consideration as of broadband as transportation infrastructure. Finally, we encourage federal investment to improve accuracy of travel demand modeling. And this will help us ensure more accurate travel forecasts and help states achieve performance targets and make cost-effective, sustainable decisions for the use instead of the general purpose lane expansion. Madam Chair and members, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Future generations are relying on us to make these important decisions to address climate change and transportation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Van Amberg, you're now recognized for five minutes to uh, give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. 
Thank you very much, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves, distinguished members of the Select Committee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss transformative transportation policies that can combat climate, the climate, climate crisis. I serve as the Executive Vice President of CalSTART, the nation's largest and oldest clean transportation technology industry consortia. Our mission is to create and support an industry that cuts emissions while creating good jobs. Our members, nearly 300, including all of America's major car, truck, and bus makers, plus the new electric-only manufacturers, their major and emerging component suppliers, as well as leading U.S. fleets, utilities, and others. Today, I want to stress the benefits of the product revolution emerging in zero-emission commercial vehicles, trucks and buses, and their benefits beyond climate change. Spurring these technologies is critical to American technology leadership and competitiveness, to creating good paying jobs from assembly line to infrastructure installation, and to reducing harmful air quality impacts from goods movement borne too long by disadvantaged communities. We have submitted detailed comments to the SOLAC committees just on these points. For, to realize these benefits, the time to accelerate the deployment of zero emission commercial vehicles, rational action. Medium and heavy duty trucks represent only about 4% of total vehicles on the road worldwide, but they have an outsized contribution to climate and air emissions, including nearly 30% of on-road greenhouse gas emissions and between 60 and 70% of nitrogen oxides or NOx, a major component of air pollution. E-commerce adds to this, thus decarbonizing this relatively small number of vehicles provides big paybacks in emissions reductions. Second, truck manufacturers are bringing these zero emission vehicles to the early market in low volumes sooner than many anticipated. Every major North American truck maker has zero emission trucks in early production, not just delivery vans, but also full class eight big rig tractors used to haul goods around regions such as from ports to distribution sites. Fleets are interested because these vehicles show the potential of a better business case. Now, CalSTART has developed a beachhead strategy to fast track this transformation by focusing on those applications best suited for this success first, then moving into heavier and longer range segments next. Electric transit buses were America's beachhead. Now the technology is expanding to school buses and delivery and heavy distribution trucks. Now we have a tool to track the global number of models coming to market by 2023, the available models will expand by 30%. Heavy duty models will expand by 80%. Third, global competition is not idle. Our global commercial vehicle drive to zero program allows us to track the significant Asian and European investments being made in infrastructure and purchase incentives, investments aimed at owning technology and manufacturing leadership for these nations. So fourth, there is a strong need for federal leadership and a strong partnership with industry in the US to support tech demonstration, to expand domestic manufacturing and to incentivize our fleets to deploy these vehicles in communities that need them most. Now the select committee's majority staff report uh, last year recommended several approaches that CalSTARTS companies support, including the need to create commercial vehicle incentives an approach we've long advocated and we're pleased to see included in the president's American jobs plan, as well as the need for charging and refueling in infrastructure along highway corridors and manufacturing supply chain support. Several of these recommendations are moving forward. The Invest in America Act proposes significant investment for the zero emission bus grant program, putting us on track to meet the deployments called for by Congresswoman Brownlee's Green Bus Act of 2021. It also proposes robust funding for alternative fuel corridors and we thank the chair for her amendment to the Invest in America Act to give states more flexibility to support the purchase of zero emission commercial vehicles and infrastructure. However, in the early market when volumes are low and costs are higher, there is nothing more critical than point of sale or cash in lieu of vehicle purchase incentives. Truck makers and fleets consistently tell us that traditional tax incentives do not influence commercial vehicle purchase decisions. Fleets need the vehicle cost reduced at the time of sale. In our written testimony, we've described the success of this model at the state level in several states in which we have put this practice into play. But a truck purchase tax incentive coupled with direct pay component at the federal level, as we recommend, would accelerate zero emission fleet integration in all states, deploying nearly 480,000 clean trucks and buses, providing the emissions equivalent to taking 4.5 million cars off the road and supporting 55,000 direct and indirect jobs over the next decade. 
We thank the Select Committee for its good work to date, but really stress the important work yet to do. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Bryce, you are now recognized for five minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Over the past 15 months, I've written a book, uh, published a book, I've co-produced a feature-length documentary, and I've launched a podcast, all of which talk about the importance of electricity to humans and society. Darkness kills human potential, and electricity nourishes it. I'm pro-electricity, but I'm adamantly opposed to the idea that we should electrify everything, and, in, and that includes transportation. I'll focus on three issues here, affordability, resilience, and supply chains. But first, just a bit of context. Uh, EVs are cool, they're, they're gaining in popularity, but they are not new. In fact, the history of electric vehicles is a century of failure, tailgating, failure. In, in 1911, the New York Times wrote, the electric car has long been recognized as the ideal solution. In 1990, the California Air Resources Board mandated that 10% of car sales be zero emission vehicles by 2003. And yet today, 31 years later, only about 6% of the cars in California have an electric plug. So now let me talk about affordability and social equity. There's a problem here with affordability for the vehicles themselves. The average household income for EV buyers in America is about $140,000. That's roughly twice the US average. And yet these federal tax credits for EV purchases are, are forcing low and middle income taxpayers to subsidize effectively the bins and Beamer crowd. Lower income Amer Americans are also facing huge electric rate increases for grid upgrades to accommodate EVs, even though they were, are likely uh, unlikely to ever own one or even drive one. This can be seen by looking at a report that was issued earlier this month by the California Energy Commission which estimated the state, just this, this is California alone, will need 1.3 million new public charging stations by 2030 with the likely cost of something on the order of $13 billion. The same report says California may need 5,000 megawatts of new generation capacity just to recharge EVs. Meanwhile, blackouts in California are almost certain this summer and electricity prices, as I wrote in my piece in Real Clear Energy last Friday, are absolutely exploding. Last year alone, California's electric rates went up 7.5%, and the state estimates they'll rise by another 40% by 2030. This in a state with the highest poverty rate and largest Latino population in America. How is racial justice or social equity being served by these regressive policies? California demonstrates how not to manage an electric grid and how difficult and how expensive it is to deploy EVs at scale. Now let me talk about resilience. Electrifying everything is the opposite of anti-fragile. Electrifying transportation will put all of our energy eggs into one basket. It will make the grid an even bigger target for terrorists, cyber thieves, or bad actors. It will reduce resilience and reliability in case of a prolonged grid failure, in cases of natural disaster, equipment failure, or human error, all of which are inevitable. Attempting to electrify transportation also makes little sense given the ongoing fragilization of our grid due to increased use of weather-dependent renewables and just-in-time natural gas. Since 2016, the number of grid outages per year, what the DOE calls major disturbances and unusual occurrences, has nearly tripled. The blackout in California, or the blackout here in Texas, which I suffered through in, in February, as well as the blackouts in California are indicative of the fragilization of our grid. Finally, let me talk about supply chains. Mass adoption of EVs will make the U.S. more dependent on China. Electrifying half of the U.S. auto fleet would require, in rough terms, nine times the world's current cobalt production, four times global neodymium, three times global lithium, and two times global copper. Except for copper, except for copper China has a majority share in the processing of all of those materials, including a 90% share in rare earths, which includes, of course, neodymium. The conclusion here is that oil's dominance in transportation is largely due to its high energy density. That density and ongoing improvements in internal combustion engines and hybrids assures that oil will be fueling transport for decades to come. If Congress wants to reduce emissions, it should be focusing on reduce or increasing the fuel efficiency of the entire automotive fleet. It should be fostering micro-mobility, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. And finally, Congress should act immediately to preserve existing nuclear plants. The April 30th closure of the Indian Point nuclear plant in, in New York was a travesty. 
Congress must do whatever it can to prevent the closure of, 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 new, of other nuclear plants, including Byron and Dresden in Illinois and Diablo Canyon in California. Powerful lobby groups want Congress to spend billions on electrification. But these schemes will increase regressive taxation on low-income Americans, reduce our resilience, and impose uh, and increase our reliance on China. That, unfortunately, is a dubious trifecta. Thank you. All right, Ms. Osborne, you are now recognized uh, to give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, Chairwoman Castor and Ranking Member Graves, and thank you for inviting me to today's hearing. I am the Director of Transportation for America, a national nonprofit committed to a transportation system that connects people to jobs and essential services by all modes of travel, no matter their financial means or physical ability. We do our work through direct technical assistance, research and analysis of how the existing transportation system is working, and advocacy. We have heard already, and we'll hear many more times today, that transportation is the sector emitting the most carbon, and it is going in the wrong direction. To address it, we need to reduce vehicle emissions, and we need a transportation system that allows for shorter trips and less vehicle use. I'm here to talk about the latter. While we talk a lot about vehicles, we have mostly ignored the impact of our transportation priorities and investments on travel. Our system forces people to travel alone more and farther, and, and they're traveling farther every year. Not only is that an expensive imposition on the traveling public, it undermines the great work we're doing on vehicles. Well, let me be clear, Transportation for America strongly supports transitioning to zero emissions vehicles. In fact, we co-lead an electrification coalition with a clean cars campaign called Charge. But it's worth remembering that past improvements in vehicle efficiency have been severely undermined by increases in driving, leaving a net increase in emissions. Electrifying the fleet is essential, but we simply do not have the luxury of stopping there, no more than we could improve the efficiency of HVAC systems in our buildings while leaving the windows open. The climate will not be so impressed by the electrification of our fleet that it will forgive a big spike in carbon emissions along the way. Additionally, we don't want a surgical fix to carbon that leaves other emissions in the air. A vehicle tailpipe is not the only emitter. Electric vehicles still generate per particulate matter through brake dust and the breakdown of rubber tires. The pavement itself emits dangerous pollutants on hot days. Roadways create stormwater runoff, add to the amount of impervious surfaces, and contribute to the heat island effect. If people aren't pushed to drive more every year, we could stop adding more and more pavement. Addressing the transportation system so that people can take shorter trips, share them, and make more trips outside of a car also pays dividends to the consumer through lower household transportation costs. Transportation is usually the second largest household expense, making it possible, for example, for a family of five to function with two cars instead of four, like mine did growing up, can save substantial funds that could be better used for home ownership, household improvements, retirement, and education. Most concerning, the roadway system has gotten more dangerous for those outside of a car with pedestrian fatalities increasing year over year and all fatalities spiking greatly last year. That burden is not shared equally. Black and Native Americans are significantly more likely to be struck and killed as a pedestrian, as are older Americans. Risking your life to cross the street is not much of a choice. There are huge equity and climate implications when we require even short distances to be traversed only through driving. To improve roadway safety, we need to update our roadway designs to include those both in and out of a car. Overall, we must provide more reliable, high-quality transit and locate the things people need close to where they live. And our various infrastructure programs, from transportation to housing to economic development, should be optimized to provide those choices, not, as is often the case now, to cut them off. We need to update our methods of measuring the performance of the transportation system to include everyone traveling, particularly using multimodal access to jobs and essential services, as Ranking Member Graves pointed out, which both the House and Senate reauthorization proposals address, though the House does it better. Rather than view this as an overwhelming effort to restructure the built environment, let's start with two basic ideas. One, the built environment is changing all of the time, and that will continue whether we engage or not. So we might as well harness it for lowering costs, improving access to economic opportunity, lowering emissions, and improving public health benefits. Two, we need only start by getting out of our own way. We could remove regulatory barriers to town center and infill development and update roadway designs for safety. 
We can look at areas where it's destination rich, but there's low access due to dangerous crossings, barriers, and winding driving routes. And we could create better connections, usually through low cost, simple interventions. If we take this approach to decarbonizing our transportation system, along with cleaning up vehicles, we will achieve way more than just addressing climate emissions. I thank you for your time and look forward to the discussion and questions. Well, I want to thank all of our witnesses for their insightful and informative testimony. And I'm going to go ahead and, and recognize Mr. Kasten of Illinois uh, because he has a bill up in another committee. Rep. Kasten, you're recognized for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chair Caster, and uh, thank you to all of my uh, my friends on the committee for allowing me to hop the order a little bit. Um, uh, Mr. Van Emberg, I'd like to start with you. Um, at number one, I cannot thank you enough for stressing that um, it's vehicle first cost that really drives these decisions. I'm, I come from 20 years in the power industry, and maybe it's maybe it's my curse, but I always think of a car as a power plant you don't run very often. And uh, and for power plants you run all the time, you think a lot about you know your operating costs and therefore fuel efficiency. For power plants that don't run, it's the first cost. And uh, and that's I've, I've introduced last term the Efficient Vehicle uh, Leadership Act, which was essentially Senator Jeff Bingaman's old Feebates bill, but updated for modern vehicle technologies. And we'll be reintroducing that shortly. The economics I think is easy to understand that the overwhelming majority of the cost of a vehicle is the cost of a vehicle, not the operating cost. Have you done any research on actual the, you know, consumer behavior to flesh that out as far as what really drives consumer choices, particularly as we think about how aggressively to shape these fee-based structures? Yeah, it, it, it's a really good question. Uh, I think, and it's different to be real frank with you, between consumers on the passenger car side who make a set of decisions based on different things than what a fleet decides on. A fleet is very much driven by total cost of ownership. So they really do kind of factor in, how do I make this tool pay off for me? And in that case, it is upfront cost, but it's also looking at the life cost of the vehicle on fuel and maintenance and the like. And, and that's really why in the commercial world, fleets are starting to look at electric drive. So there's one set of tools I think I would suggest for the heavy duty or the, or the commercial space, and maybe a slightly different set for passenger vehicles. You know, passenger vehicle uh, buyers are really sensitive to um, what is this vehicle going to do for me? There is a range issue involved. So there are some of those issues that they want to factor in for themselves, but they actually do want to say, hey, look, I am getting a fee bait is really interesting because it gives you a reward for one choice. And if you want to make another choice, that's fine, but you pay for the privilege. It's kind of allowing people to pay for their choices based on a new set of metrics. And I think that signal is actually really important to somebody. They'll go, oh, wait a minute, I could buy this one that's more fuel efficient and I might get a kickback or I buy this thing that's less efficient and I'm gonna to have to pay a little surcharge. That's a pretty powerful signal to a consumer. Well, thank you, I'm a, I'm a stickler for market forces. So I appreciate that. Um, what, what I wanna shift to, uh, to Ms. Osborne and ask, see if you can solve a, a thorny problem in the Chicago area for me. Um, no problem. I'd love, I love your idea about like, we need to not only you know, you know, shift to more efficient vehicles, but get vehicle miles traveled down. One of the great frustrations in Chicago is I think something like 40% of rail freight traffic comes through the city. And so, you know, the people where I live do not want to spend all day in traffic on the Eisenhower, but because our rail line, the commuter rail fights for service with the freight rail service, um, they don't have a lot of other choices. Um, there are obvious solutions. They cost a lot of money and they pick a lot of NIMBY fights. Um, have you heard any 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 real robust solutions for for the Chicago area specifically, but also for regions like Chicago, where you have this wonderful rail network, but a rail network that really wasn't designed with commuters in mind? Yeah, it's a very good question, and you really gave me a tough one too. Um, <laughs> oh, I gave you a minute and twenty seconds. <laughs> so, so I should just fix all the <laughs> rail problems in Chicago. I, I grew up in New Orleans, and we also have a confluence of a ton of rail lines that go through uh, areas that, uh, um, you know, don't necessarily work with the community that exists there now. Um, it is a complicated issue, and especially in these uh, urban areas that need to accommodate not just the traditional modes of rail from, uh, or modes of transportation from freight rail and, and commuter rail, uh, but all kinds of new modes of travel, it's getting more complicated. And it's one of the reasons I think our old tools that we continue to rely on are so unhelpful in addressing some of these circumstances. 
But uh, when it comes to these cities that uh, have a confluence of, of uh, not just uh, freight and, and people moving, but uh, you know, people coming in and out of the region, I think we're probably going to have to put some real money into separating uh, those various users. So with, with 20 seconds left, this is totally unfair, Commissioner Kelleher, but do you have any thoughts on, I know you've put some thought into shifting to a VMT-based fee structure, and I'm, I'm always struck by the fact that people will willingly give private information to Google that they don't want to give to the United States government. Any guidance on how, what have you done to get to ease the uptake to a VMT system in Minnesota? Well, thank you for the question. And I think that the, the first thing is we're working in partnership with our other states around the country on the issue of what is going to be the replacement for what typically is called uh, you know, the fuel tax cliff at some point into the future. I think we, we shouldn't overblow that cliff though right now. It's still a workhorse of what we do. We are working on voluntary pilots uh, with uh, Missouri, with Kansas, with Iowa, to work on uh, these issues of particularly how rural users feel about vehicle miles traveled and adoption of vehicle miles traveled. Not so much focused on what the fee will be, but focused on the technology and comfort with the technology. So I think that is one of the main places that we are going to put our effort is working with our rural and suburban users on how we can share information. Thank you, and I'm over time. I appreciate the chair's indulgence. I yield back. Mr. Armstrong, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is just a perfect example of difference in districts. I don't so much view my car as a mobile power plant. I don't use those very often as my office in district, my apartment in district, my occasional storm shelter in district and a place that just by the nature of the district I represent, I have to spend a lot of time in. And commodity-based economies like North Dakota rely on all of the above energy um, to get our goods to market. We utilize rail, pipeline, roads, highways. Uh, but if we're gonna have the conversation about mass adoption of electric vehicles, particularly in the heartland, then, and particularly for commercial use, then we have to consider how we're going to deal with the increased wear and tear on our surface and in infrastructure and how we're gonna pay for that. In 2019, when the president of Cummings Distribution Business testified before this committee, he noted that in order to have a tractor head that would have the same range and power as today's diesel engine and fuel tank, weight would need to increase by a factor of three to five times to accommodate enough batteries to give the same power and range. And Volvo's midsize regional truck for short routes weighs 8,000 pounds more than its diesel component. So when we're dealing with these things, it's not just a federal deployment of this. We have, I mean, we've dealt with all of these things in North Dakota. We have weight, restri weight restrictions on state roads. We have weight restrictions on county roads. We have all of those things. So one of two things has to happen. We either have to increase the weight restrictions, which means we're going to have to rebuild up every single county road in North Dakota, or we're going to haul less product per trip. Now, if we're going to haul less product per trip, and we're, going to, and we're going to deal with charging stations, all of these different issues. We haven't even talked about the regulations as for hours of service for transport, for all of those things. But the bottom line to this is if you live in Grafton, North Dakota, and you are taking a load of potatoes to Minnesota, two things are going to happen. You're going to, be, you're going to be able to haul less of that product, which is going to increase the price. And it's going to take you twice as long to get there and back under current rules or regulations. So what does that mean? We're going to, we're going to increase the cost for ag products, which we produce and provide to the entire country and the world. And none of that increase in cost is going to go to the producer. In fact, we're going to actually increase the cost of the producers as well. So the people in the middle who are going to make this are going to be um, dealt with in transportation. And so when we talk about increasing the, the cost, not only about charging stations, I mean, giving subsidies to $80,000 Teslas, we have to recognize that as we deploy this under current technology, the cost of the goods we haul in those trucks is going to go up. So Mr. Bryce, in your testimony, you discussed taxpayer-funded subsidies given to EV buyers, publicly funded charging stations, and grid upgrades needed to support electrification. But it's not just those subsidies that benefit EV drivers at the expense of those who drive internal combustion engines. Every time someone purchases fuel, they pay they pay a tax, which funds infrastructure. 
EV drivers don't pay into the system, but operate vehicles that are heavier than their internal combustion engine counterparts. Can you discuss how this pushes the burden of road maintenance onto drivers who do pay fuel taxes? Uh, yes, thank you, Representative Armstrong. Yes, this is one of the thorny problems with electrification of transportation is that you have unequal distribution of benefits. Um, I, I saw, I was noticing in Colorado, they passed some electrification uh, legislation and they talked about reduced maintenance costs for those automobiles. Well, those reduced maintenance costs accrue to the owners of the EVs themselves, not to society as a whole. So I think this issue of the, 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 the motor fuel tax is one that, again, that Congress is going to have to uh, have to take on, and it's a difficult one because the, you know, the Congress already, the, as I recall, the Biden administration is not in favor of increasing the gasoline tax. But so I, it, it, some of the states do have, as a memory, memory serves, about two dozen states have enacted some higher fee on EV drivers. Uh, but again, that's highly, uh, it, it, it's differentiated among the states. I will make one point quickly about North Dakota, sir, which is that the adoption of, of light duty vehicle e EVs in North Dakota has been very low. Uh, if memory serves, less than a thousand EVs in the entire state. So there's a, also a very une un uneven distribution of EVs among the states and in North Dakota, South Dakota, the northern states, there, there, there are very few of them. It is very cold in North Dakota and a lot of people drive long distances. And that's, a, a, and that's just, those are the restrictions. We know this is going to deploy faster in urban areas and I understand all of that. But as we continue to have this conversation and moving forward, I think it's important to recognize that there's a difference between a school, school bus in a school district in New Jersey and a school bus in a school district that covers 260 miles, not because people want to drive more, because that's how far we go to get groceries sometimes. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Rep Bonamici, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves, and thank you to our witnesses. This is a timely hearing as we are marking the one-year anniversary of releasing the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, and also as the House considers the Invest in America Act to reauthorize surface transportation programs. I do want to note that um, in my home state of Oregon, we've been doing great work in vehicle miles traveled. So um, people can look there for another example of where it's, it's working to, to first pilot and then implement a program. We know, as we've heard this morning, that transportation sector is a largest source of energy-related carbon dioxide emissions in the country and our most vulnerable communities are disproportionately affected by the resulting pollution. Fortunately, our Climate Action Plan and the Invest in America Act will help change this reality. We have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to build back better by investing in zero-emission buses, transit, electric vehicle charging stations, pedestrian and bike infrastructure, and decarbonize the transportation sector. These efforts, as we know, will create good-paying jobs and also support frontline communities. I want to start with Mr. Van Amberg. Uh, in Northwest Oregon, Daimler Trucks and Portland General Electric recently opened a new heavy-duty electric truck charging site in Portland's Swan Island Industrial District. The site, which is known as Electric Island, is designed to accelerate the development, testing, and deployment of electric commercial vehicles. It's of particular interest to our region, given the significant air pollution from traffic on the I-5 corridor which disproportionately affects communities of color living in adjacent neighborhoods as a result of historically racist redlining policies. So Mr. Van Amberg, what are the current challenges in deploying charging infrastructure for heavy duty electric trucks and how can Congress help address these obstacles to reduce emissions? Well, thank you so much for the question. And I, and I think it is important for Congress to see that it, it, it is a phased out strategy and in, and, and in recognition of the points made by the, the previous congressman, uh, these aren't going to be vehicles that are trucks that are going to be driving in every duty cycle immediately right away. They're going to be phased out as the technology improves. But what we could be doing, uh, the first charging is going to be at the truck depots and the bus depots and their return to base fleets. The next round of charging really needs to be in fast charge hubs uh, in our cities and towns. And then kind of that next phase, which is co what Congress is really looking at and, the, and is right, is charging along our corridors and the key corridors so that we can connect key cities together, like Portland with Salem or Salem to Eugene. So these kind of things where we can start to build out from our, from our depots to our cities to key corridors is, is really the next line. And what we need to do is seed that early market. Private industry will jump into this, but they need some help to start seeding those first applications as volumes come up. Thank you, that's very helpful. Ms. Osborne, the Pacific Northwest, as everyone knows, faced a record-breaking heat wave uh, the, the past several days with temperatures exceeding 
100 degrees for multiple days. It was 115 degrees at my house two days ago. Uh, TriMet, the Portland Metro Area's transit agency, temporarily suspended uh, the, the max light rail service after the unprecedented temperatures pushed the system's uh, cables, which uh, off, uh, contain copper, uh, to its limit. And TriMet noted that the MAX system is designed to operate in conditions uh, up to 110 degrees, which should be all right because the average high temperature in Portland is usually 77, uh, but of course it exceeded that. So Ms. Osborne, how can Congress help local transit agencies better prepare for the increasing consequences of the climate crisis, and what steps do we need to take immediately to make sure that our transportation system is more resilient? Yeah, it's a, a really important question. I have a colleague, one of our uh, uh, staffers is located in, in Portland and uh, has been keeping us abreast of the, the difficult situation out there. Um, but clearly we're going to have to start to anticipate and plan for these kinds of events because they're going to become more frequent all across the country. We here in DC are also experiencing pretty high temperatures for the time. So um, I, I think some of the things that the House bill has uh, included in terms of planning for resilience and incorporating uh, climate change in our planning is going to be essential. Putting real money into retrofitting these systems to be able to handle the conditions they're gonna see more frequently, whether it be high temperatures or fires or flooding or, or whatever else is gonna come with climate change is gonna be important. And I think what's even more important is making sure we don't put out anything new into the world that isn't equally as prepared. What we don't wanna do is, is continue to create problems that need to be retrofitted with our programs that we're creating now to retrofit past problems. Thank you so much. And as I yield back, Madam Chair, I just want to address the issue that was raised about the weight of electric vehicles. I serve on the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, and I know with a combination of the research and the increase in consumer demand, I'm sure that uh, the weight issue is going to be addressed so that uh, we are uh, lowering the weight of electric vehicles. And I, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Crenshaw, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, it, it, being about transportation and in context, um, of the broader conversation on environmental justice and how to define that, you know, I'm going to narrow down or, or zero in on on how these two on how these two issues might conflict. Um, Ms. Anderson Keller, you you talk about environmental justice quite a bit in your in your testimony. I'm curious what legal definition you're operating off of and how you use that to plan projects in in Minnesota. Well, thank you for the question. We are working off of a set of communities that have historically been impacted uh, negatively by transportation. So I'm going to point to one in particular, the I-94 corridor between Minneapolis and St. Paul, the historic Rondo neighborhood that was destroyed, a black neighborhood destroyed by the interstate highway system. There, um, no legal definition is needed because uh, every ounce of wealth out of the middle of that community was uh, taken out of it. So now we are working on the Rethinking I-94 project, which uh, it has a, a number of goals. Uh, one of the goals is to lessen the health impacts of the highway system on the community. It is also to increase the economic wealth of the community by reconnecting okay. the potential land. The, 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 this sounds so, like this sounds like good development and planning, just generally speaking. But that's not an environmental justice definition, as you said. There, there's no legal definition, and this matters quite a bit because as we as we exalt the this this notion of environmental justice to such a to such an extent that it, it becomes fodder for groups to sue. It becomes fodder for the federal government to perhaps sue states and stop. Uh, certain expansions based on a definition that apparently does not exist. And so you, you got to define it at some point. Um, the White House has sought to define it um, with their Council on Environmental Justice report from Gina McCarthy. I mean, would you generally agree with that report? Would you Madam generally? Chair, was that a question for me? Yes. Yeah. Still, we're still, you and I are still talking. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Representative. Uh, we actually use the definition uh, from the 1994 Inge Environmental Justice Order as our uh, legal definition of environmental justice. All right. Okay. 
Can you explain what that is then? Like what are, what are some of the uh, definitions involved in that one? So representative, I'll have to get back to you on the legal definitions in the 1994 environmental justice order. Okay. Look, the, the White House has um, come out with something and I, I imagine you guys will, will, will probably agree with it. Um, now I find it a little troubling because it specifically says that federal investment dollars that flow towards things like, quote, road improvements or automobile infrastructure would not benefit communities and wouldn't meet the do no harm standard require under environmental justice. And I'd like to insert this report um, into the record. Mm -hmm. So can Without you com can, can you can you comply with recommendations like that? You know, can, how, how can you develop anything in your home state with recommendations such as that? How would the uh, construction project and you know the I-35 projects in downtown Minneapolis be affected by guidance like this? Well, Representative, uh, we are on track to deliver the I-94-35W project in September of this year, fully complete after four years with bus rapid transit, uh, as well as increased biking and walking lanes and increased HOV capacity. These right. you'd be in, tools, but you'd be in direct conflict with the White House guidance. You know, this is what, this is what I'm pointing out here. I mean, it says on on page 59, examples of types of projects that will not benefit of community and would go against environmental justice standards. Uh, number five, research and development. Just that's just research and development. Not good. Number ten, or sorry, number nine, road improvements or automobile infrastructure other than electrical vehicle charging stations. So. You might want to write the White House and ask them what they're doing and, and, why, and why this is why this would be part of the uh, why, part of the standards. It's important to define these things. I'm out of time and I, I yield back. Th thank you, Madam Chair. You're free to respond if the chair will will allow it. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Go we ahead. actually are developing a number of tools in Minnesota that will help meet these standards. And uh, one of them is a health impact assessment that will directly fit into the White House's uh, parameters that will help us as Minnesota be able, and we will share with other states, be able to uh, do the assessment of how communities who have historically been overburdened with transportation infrastructure uh, will be impacted. And then we will make our decisions from there, including more transit, more biking, walking, other facilities, uh, HOV facilities as well. And uh, furthermore, the other part of this is resilience and making sure communities are not uh, harmed by runoff, flooding, and a number of other things that come with the building of roadways. Thank you very much. Uh, Rep Brownlee, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for having this important hearing and certainly a timely uh, hearing as well. So thank you for that. Mr. Van Amberg, uh, first I want to thank you for your plug on my green bus bill. So thank you very much uh, for that. And it sounds like based on your testimony today, it sounds like uh, buses are really helping to lead the way for heavy trucks and, you know, the big rigs and, and so forth in terms of moving in that direction. So um, I hope uh, most of the provisions of the Green uh, Bus Bill got into the Invest in America Act. Um, and uh, so hopefully that will certainly make a difference in terms of uh, cities uh, trans, uh, transitioning uh, to zero emission uh, buses. I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Kasten was asking you about sort of uh, market drivers or signals, uh, and you were talking about it was different for uh, personal vehicles versus light duty or heavy duty uh, trucks. And so, you know, I'd like for you to talk um, a little bit about that, if you could, and in it's, it's astonishing to me that, um, you know, the development of heavy duty vehicles, have, as you describe them, uh, the speed at which they, that has moved along um, is, is quite a big success. And I was wondering, 
um, other than uh, you know providing resources and investment at the point of purchase, are there any other uh, are there any other uh, things that you would credit to that speed? Well, thank you very much, Representative Randley. And you definitely deserve a, a head nod for the, the great work that you're doing on the uh, Green Bus uh, Act. So I think uh, what's exciting right now is I think what we have found is a degree of technology transfer that's much higher than we have ever seen, not just between heavy duty vehicle types, but actually from light duty into heavy duty. And that includes things like battery cells, battery packs, power electronics. I, I don't need to get into the minutia, but it's, uh, some of the speed is attributable to the fact that we actually are getting components that are capable of being transferred into these larger and heavier vehicles. When it comes to the purchase decision, uh, the biggest thing for the commercial user is, is looking at that total cost of ownership. And they do factor in the reduced cost uh, of the fuel, the reduced cost of maintenance, but right now the upfront cost is a little higher and they need some help. That's one. Number two though is, is really starting to give some assistance either to utilities or to the fleets to really start to put infrastructure in place faster. That's really going to be the next issue. And it's not going to have to be super expensive infrastructure all over the place to start, but it definitely has to be helping the fleets at their depots where they bring their vehicles back and then expanding into cities and corridors. Terrific. And uh, you also, uh, I think in your uh, written testimony, you uh, reference uh, the important co-benefits that um, will result from transitioning uh, our nation to zero emission vehicles beyond just the climate. So could you just expand a little bit on that? Yeah, thank you for that question. And it really struck me with some of the previous questions that were being asked by Representative Crenshaw, uh, particularly on uh, equity uh, and environmental justice. These, you know, as opposed to cars, big trucks operate uh, a lot of the time, they operate a lot of hours and generally they're operating in places where people are bearing the brunt of that higher pollution load from those vehicles. And disadvantaged communities actually exist. You can see them really clearly on the map. You can see where the emission load is. You can see where the lower economics are. And, and you can layer that and see it. We've really targeted in all of our work and, and just an example from California in the incentive program, 60% of the trucks that get incentive funding in California actually are trucks that operate in the community. It's not only something that's climate, you know, and it also is good jobs, it's actually getting more micro-focused emissions reductions in the key communities that count. And so I think that's really an important one. Uh, uh, thank you for that. And I, I just really have a half a minute, but um, uh, quickly to Commissioner Kelleher. I, I was curious to know how Minnesota um, has deployed uh, vehicle charging stations uh, to uh, maximize their impact while keeping equity in mind. So um, I have. Thank you. <laughs> you can, uh, can I respond? Please, please answer briefly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have over a thousand level two charging stations, over 200 fast chargers. We have about 20,000 vehicles on the road right now. They're electric vehicles. We have a report of a uh, dealer near the Canadian border who has 50 orders for the F-150 Lightning truck. Uh, I think uh, that helps answer where we're going and we'll have more deployment after this legislative session. Thank you, Madam Speaker, or Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, Rep Palmer, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I want to go back to Mr. Bryce and, and talking about uh, uh, how the plans put forward by my Democrat colleagues and, and, and the Biden administration will impact rural communities, uh, and particularly the, uh, the transportation uh, bill. There's no funding for new roads. Uh, those are, and there's a huge amount of funding for mass transit. That really doesn't help people in, in rural communities of what many of my liberal friends consider fly, flyover country. Uh, doesn't that create uh, uh, not only uh, an, an economic injustice, but an energy injustice for families and households in, that, in those areas? 
Well, Representative, this is one of the, the big challenges that Congress has to deal with is the urban rural divide. The, and this is present in, in, of course, in our politics where uh, mostly Democratic voters live, or a lot of Democratic voters live in cities, and, and more uh, conservative and Republican voters live in, 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 uh, in, the, in, the, in what you call flyover country. But it, it becomes particularly, I think, problematic when it comes to the transportation sector, because as you point out rightly, a lot of this money is directed toward pro projects that will benefit uh, uh, people who live in cities and, pro and, and provide more mobility in cities. Let um, me, but, I, but I talked about California in my written testimony and, and yeah. also in my spoken testimony because that's a, it's another example there of some of these inequities about the concentration of EVs being uh, a, a lot of take up in, in urban areas, but not in rural areas. You've written an article that was in the New York Post entitled Lower Middle Class Americans Will Pay a Fortune for Biden's Wind Power Plan. And you talk about some of that, but I also would like to bring to the committee's attention a letter from uh, Jim Cooper, I believe he's an African-American member of the uh, Budget Subcommittee in the California Assembly. Uh, and he talks about the Public Policy Institute of California reports that California residential electric power rates are almost 56% higher than the average in, in other states. And he really talks about how a point you just made about the electric vehicles, about the renewables, and how it, most of the benefit of that's going to the coastal cities and the, and the brunt of the cost is being borne by people who really can't afford it. Uh, it's a, uh, it, 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 I want right. to move I, I, go ahead. to something else. And, and sure. in particular, going back to, as we think about our transportation grid, how important it is to build new roads, and particularly in urban areas. Uh, we talk about the amount of pollution that uh, and emissions in those areas, but one of the reasons we have so much, and there's a great report from the University of Alabama, they've been doing a study uh, with uh, Texas A&M University, and, and it's based on data taken every 15 minutes at hundreds of locations for almost every mile of major roads in 494 U.S. urban areas, looking at, at the amount of, uh, the impact of congestion. And the way you reduce congestion is, is not to try to force every urban area to, to adopt mass transit and get people out of their cars and then on trains and buses. It is to improve your infrastructure, your transportation system, reduce the amount of time of, uh, that people spend in congestion in their cars, and it reduces emissions. Uh, do you want to uh, comment on that? Well, I, 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 I don't know the study you're talking about, sir, but I, I would make one quick comment about the issue of vehicle, vehicle miles traveled, which, you know, I've been I'm just studying what's going on in California. Latino groups, the, a group called the 200, which is a coalition of Latino leaders in California, have sued the state over their VMT rules because they're saying that these are regressive, that they are increasing costs and reducing mobility for low and middle income uh, consumers, and that that's a problem because mobility is essential for for people who are, are you know working class folks, and they want to own a home. I've and, got and having higher VMT charges means that it limits their ability in terms of home ownership because it limits their mobility. I recommend people read your articles in the post, but I've got one other thing. In your testimony, you commented on the threat uh, that we have to our power grid. And uh, uh, there's a, a report from Lloyd's of London on the solar storm risk to North Met, uh, American electric grid. And I, I keep telling people that that we've got other issues that we need to address that are that I think are more pressing than CO2 emissions. And I'll just quickly tell you that the total U.S. population at risk of extended power outage from a Carrington level event, that was a severe event in 1859, is between 20 and 40 million with durations of 16 days to one, uh, one to two years and a cost of 600 billion to 2.6 trillion. Uh, we have got to prepare for things like that. I, I agree with you, Representative, and, and this is what it's an issue I bring in, I bring up in my in my new book that the the electric grid is very fragile, and we've seen the fragilization of the grid. These extended outages. It's one reason why more Americans are buying standby generators. But yes, the solar flares or the Carrington event could be catastrophic for the U.S. And this is something that a lot of people have talked about about the need to uh, to uh, uh, invest in in in, uh, in 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 grid protection and 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 grid uh, uh, adaptability and resilience. I'd appreciate seeing your work on that. I yield back. Thank you. Next, uh, Mr. Huffman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is so appropriate that we are taking up this subject of uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector in a week when the INVEST Act 
uh, is on the floor of the House of Representatives. We know how hugely important the transportation sector is for our interconnected lives, our jobs, and commerce, but uh, it's also number one uh, when it comes to greenhouse gas pollution. So we have to uh, tackle this part of the climate crisis, and we've got to transform this sector from something dependent almost entirely on fossil fuels to something that is a lot cleaner and more resilient, uh, and I, I think we're having an important part of that conversation uh, here today. Um, we know that we're going to need to be very aggressive on fuel efficiency, uh, zero emission vehicles, reducing vehicle miles traveled. These aren't just priorities from Democrats. We're seeing industry already leading the way and moving in this direction uh, with exciting announcements from General Motors and, and Ford, uh, among many, many other zero emission vehicles. Makes sense from a business case. Uh, it is where the industry is heading. And I can tell you as an EV driver, it's just a better way to get around too. So uh, I'm excited about it, but I am confused, frankly, uh, about Mr. Bryce's testimony. Um, you know, on a, on a week when we've got 120 degree weather in the Pacific Northwest, I was hoping that we would begin to hear some solutions from our friends across the aisle that match the scale of the crisis that's just increasingly obvious. Uh, what we continue to hear, unfortunately, are just things that they're against. And Mr. Bryce brought up a whole bunch of creative reasons, really loaded up a lot of creative uh, arguments against electric vehicles. Uh, I found it really confusing then when in his testimony he said, but notwithstanding all of these terrible things about EVs, if we could just power everything with nuclear, he'd be for them. That um, is some cognitive dissonance. But I, I just want to announce, or I just want to invite our friends across the aisle that at some point, instead of just vilifying Green New Deals and proposals to electrify vehicles, we got to get you in the game of coming up with solutions that match the scale of this crisis. We really have to change that conversation. But Mr. Van Amberg, since Mr. Bryce did bring up uh, this specter of electric vehicles causing the California grid to uh, collapse, uh, I'm gonna just well, start there you, with you, you uh, and you invite you to, Huffman, uh, can I respond to, your, to your well, this is my time, Mr. Bryce, and okay. uh, yeah, I, I'm gonna ask Mr. Van Amberg to respond to what you said in your testimony, if you'll allow me to do that. So, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Van Amberg, are we gonna put an excessive strain on the grid? Can the grid handle this move toward electrification that, that we're seeing on uh, transportation in California? Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's always, it's a good question. Thank you, Representative Huffman. It's always uh, worth our looking and taking a deep look at this. From the, the point of view of the uh, transmission grid, there really is no uh, uh, issue with having sufficient electricity, even to start putting the big rig trucks onto the grid as that starts to happen. The utility sector does need to really uh, grow out. And this is part of something that I think we can all agree on is modernizing our grid. And the distribution grid is in great need of, of further beefing up. Uh, because even as we, we put in new load for buildings and, and businesses and the like, the utilities often don't have enough power in their distribution grid. Plenty of power at the transmission side, not enough at, at distribution. And we need modernization for a variety of things. We're concerned about cybersecurity, uh, much less you know, Carrington level events. So I think you know, we're all, I think, can agree on that. But no, the grid is not going to suffer some cataclysm uh, from transportation. In fact, one of the beauties I think that we're seeing is that a lot of, uh, say, bus depots, as they're starting to put in, say, 50 to 100 electric buses on a site, are starting to put in backup power that can actually add resiliency to the grid. It's distributed energy resources and backup power. I was going to ask you about Ford that. the Ford F-150. Yes, th the Ford F-150 uh, video showed a, a truck that was powering a home and pushing power in the opposite way onto the grid. I was going to ask you, is there a scenario in the future where EVs plugged into the grid actually become something that fortifies the grid? Absolutely. Uh, we're already seeing it with school buses as they're parked during the day and charging. They actually become a backup uh, power source. Some vehicles have been used in disasters actually to power forward the relief crews. Uh, so yes, we're already seeing this. And we basically, when they're plugged in, they become backup 
uh, power assets to the grid and adding resiliency to it. So yes, this is already starting to happen and it is part of the future grid build we need. Thank you, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Miller, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves. And thank you all for being here today. The topic before us is so important. As most of our discussions this year have centered around infrastructure, it's critical that we focus on how to address this issue in a bipartisan manner. High tax increases and unachievable mandates will neither fix nor our crumbling infrastructure, nor will they help to improve our environment. Rather, these tax increases will force businesses to go offshore to place with lower labor and environmental standards. The climate goals set by this administration require an enormous amount of critical minerals, from electrification of vehicles to powering the grid with renewable energy. We need to secure our supply chains. Unfortunately, we're not able to get most of these minerals from the United States, and instead we rely on corrupt regimes for our future energy. Above all, the energy strategy is not only what is best for America's economy and national security, but ensure that we have options and baseload energy to keep the wheels turning and the lights on no matter what. Mr. Bryce, do you know how many different types of critical minerals are required to create an electric engine battery? Well, uh, cobalt is a, is, a, is a big one. Lithium, um, the, the, uh, I believe, uh, well, I can't give you that list straight off the top of my head, but uh, as I point, uh, point out in my, uh, my written testimony, the, the mineral intensity of an electric vehicle is something on the order of six times that of an internal combustion engine fueled vehicle. So, well, there are, uh, there are 1,400 chips in a car. So what are the top countries that the United States has to purchase these critical minerals from? Well, as I mentioned in both my written testimony and, and, and in my uh, spoken remarks, China controls by far and away the, the vast, the overwhelming majority of the rare earth metals uh, that are needed, neodymium, praseodymium, et cetera. And uh, you know, what, as I've thought about this in, in advance of this hearing, you know, for most of my life, the United States and Congress have been talking about getting off of OPEC and, and demonizing OPEC, demonizing oil, foreign oil, and yet this idea that we're going to transition to electric vehicles means we'll, we're going to hand our supply chain control to the Chinese. I just, exactly. I just don't understand it. So, so what does our reliance for these critical minerals do for our national security? Well, I think it, it clearly jeopardizes that national security if we're going to make EVs the only option. And therefore, that's one of the reasons why. And I was, you know, I understand Representative Huffman doesn't necessarily like me talking about California, but California, why is it that the state is only, they only have 6% of electric vehicles on the road today? Is it possible that consumers don't want them in the volumes that the state has mandated? Well, I mean, this is the critical issue. I'd rather talk about our supply chain and how in the world okay. we are going to secure our supply chain. Well, I, I think in many, if, if, you, if you're serious about it, I just don't think it's possible for the kind of ramp up globally of the, the, the volumes of, of critical minerals, copper, neodymium, cobalt, et cetera, that, are, that are, will be required to meet this demand for EVs. And I, I cite in my written testimony the work that Professor Richard Harrington of the Museum of Natural History of London did in, in 2019 in his letter to the British government underscoring this problem. Absolutely, thank you. Um, the clock got messed up, and I would like to yield the rest of my time to Mr. Palmer. Go ahead. You're recognized, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Palmer, for two, two minutes. <laughs> this, this is awesome. Shows the vulnerability of the grid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, let's uh, pretend it's two minutes. How about that? Okay, thank you. Uh, That's what it was. I, I try to be fair. <laughs> Mr. Bryce, in your testimony, you highlighted how current EV policies lead to energy poverty, and I want to touch on that a little bit more. I grew up dirt poor. I, I, I understand the, the strain and stress on family incomes, uh, how hard it is to make ends meet. And uh, can you explain briefly, because I've got less than two minutes now, uh, how these policies lead to that inequality? Well, I think first and foremost, sir, it starts with the, the, the purchase price of the vehicles themselves. Um, I, 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 was, I went to the Costco near my house a few months ago. There was a Chevy Bolt in front. It cost $46,000. 
for that much money, I could buy a, a, a new Mercedes Benz or a new BMW. I could buy two Toyota Corollas. Okay. I mean, who, you know, working class people just simply can't afford the initial purchase price. Well, apparently, apparently wealthy people can't afford them because they're the ones taking advantage of these enormous uh, government subsidies that, uh, for these vehicles. Aren't, aren't, aren't we still subsidizing the, the purchase of these vehicles? The federal tax credit is, in fact. And I'll just add one other point, sir. For many, many homeowners, many residents, they don't have an ability to recharge electric vehicles at their homes. This is a point that the uh, General uh, the general Accounting Office has, has made over and over, that the refueling infrastructure, the recharging infrastructure for EVs simply isn't there. And as I mentioned in my written well, remarks and in my, and in my testimony yeah. just a few minutes ago, the, the, the scale of the chargers that are going to be needed is just, it, it's almost... I, I want to stick, I want to stick to the, the cost to lower income families because... They, they can't afford to charge the vehicles there. They can't afford to buy the vehicle, but in their utility rates, uh, they're helping pay for the people who can't afford those charging stations. Is that a fair assessment? That, that's a fair assessment. It was a point that was made by Assemblyman Jim Cooper, who I, I, I wrote about him in, in a, few, a, few, a few months ago. There's one Senate district in California, a Senate district in the Bay Area, that got by itself got nine times as, or I'm sorry, it got as much in EV rebates in California as nine other Senate districts combined. That's just not, it's not fair. I, I think that was mentioned in, in, in um, uh, Mr. Cooper's letter, uh, and I appreciate yes, sir. you yielding time, and I yield back. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Rep McKeachin. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Castor, for convening us today. And to the witnesses, I thank each of you for joining us. <clears throat> As we look to transform our economy and move towards a net zero carbon future, it's critical that we prioritize decarbonization of our nation's transportation sector. This will, of course, help us tackle the challenges of the climate crisis and lower carbon emissions. Maybe more important though are the opportunities we have to reduce air pollution, which often impacts disadvantage and disadvantaged and environmental justice communities disproportionately. We can also rethink what transportation means for our communities, reconnecting areas which have long been segmented and isolated due to careless highway planning. In Richmond, uh, this led to Interstate 60, this led to Interstate 64 intersecting the Shaco Hill African burial ground another in an unfortunately long list of desecrations of the site. This select committee laid out key recommendations to move our transportation system towards a clean energy future in our action plan. And I'm optimistic that we'll be able to make the necessary investments we need to solve the climate crisis. Commissioner Kelleher, again, thank you for being with us today. As we look towards the implementation of, just, of the Justice 40 initiative, one thing I've continued to stress is the importance of community input and whatever investments may result in this initiative. You mentioned in your testimony the creation of the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, created in part to support equity. What has been the result of the council's work towards equity and how have you ensured that communities, environmental justice communities in particular, have a voice in advising uh, Minnesota's DOT, uh, in, in advising Minnesota's DOT? What lessons have you learned that may be helpful for us at the federal level? Thank you. Uh, and the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee, first of all, it's co-chaired by industry with uh, the president of Excel Energy Minnesota being with me on that journey of being able to lead the work. The other uh, piece of this is equity is in every single element of what we are doing on the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Committee. Equity is not a set aside. Equity is a through uh, piece of the cloth, the entire uh, way we are looking at it. So we are looking at, uh, we are deploying right now a sustainable transportation grant program across the state that will both uh, look at both urban and rural communities and equity in urban and rural communities. We have equity uh, issues in rural Minnesota as well, both income and uh, based on our indigenous population, as well as in the urban areas with the black and Latinx population. And so we are specifically looking to make sure that those communities get to participate in that transportation pilot program. I, I appreciate your answer and thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Amberg, um, 
I'd like to talk to you about port electrification for just a few moments, if you don't mind. And um, are there specific policies that Congress should be supporting to reduce emissions from uh, dry edge trucks, moving containers in and out of our ports and other equipment operating in our ports? Yes, thank you for that question. And that's a really good one because ports are such a nexus of our transportation and goods movement system. They're also a hot spot of transportation emissions, particularly for disadvantaged and priority communities. One of the things that could be done is, is and, and it's in the Invest in America Act, is, is really looking at what can we be doing to put in infrastructure around port complexes and uh, warehouses and distribution centers. This is going to be where the first of the cleanest trucks will operate best in any respect. Secondly, I think the ports would do really well to start looking at electrifying their off-road or goods, their cargo handling equipment. We're starting to see new equipment coming out that can be near or zero emissions in that space too. No, please, I was just, please continue. If, if, if that's your answer. I wasn't yes. trying to wave you off, unfortunately. No, that's a, okay. A, a, a climate denying bug flew across my screen. <laughs> no, I think those are real opportunities, uh, for, particularly to get investment in uh, for infrastructure and support because it is co with industry. I mean, the, the load is just being shared a little bit by the public sector and but very much by the private sector so that they can deploy these vehicles more quickly in the regions of need. I thank you and I thank you for your answer. Madam Chair, I yield back to you. Thank you. Next we'll go to Rep Gonzalez. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to our panel uh, for being here today. I, I, I do feel the need to address one claim that was made, which is we're just against everything and, and uh, we're against the Green New Deal. We don't, we don't have any solutions. I mean, I, I will admit I'm passionately against the Green New Deal, primarily because it's horrible policy and it's impossible. Uh, it's scientifically impossible. It's mathematically impossible. If you read the Green New Deal, it is impossible. So I'm not for impossible things. Uh, I don't think anybody should be for impossible things. I think we should be for real things. Uh, I'm also against a, a tax and regulatory uh, push to solve every problem that we have in society, uh, climate included. I am for innovation uh, and I'm for markets. I'd also remind this committee that uh, Congress just passed the Bipartisan Energy Act of 2020. That was bipartisan and it was the first comprehensive investment in next gen energy technologies in 13 years. I personally think we should all be really proud of that. Is it exactly what my Democratic colleagues wanted? No. Did it go further than some of my Republican colleagues? Yes. Uh, but it was a bipartisan bill uh, that made substantial investments uh, that I think are going to help us lead on climate going forward uh, internationally, uh, as, as we've already done uh, through primarily through innovation. But uh, I want to shift to, to Mr. Bryce for questions. Mr. Bryce, I, I do want to thank you for your testimony, particularly the section on preserving our existing nuclear fleet, which is, again, something I'm for. Uh, as opposed to just being against everything. So in any event, couldn't agree with you more on this and I'm equally troubled by the efforts to preemptively close plants in New York, Illinois uh, and California. It was a horrible idea. Uh, what can we do to improve the public's perception of nuclear and address some of the fears associated with nuclear? Well, Representative Gonzalez, you only have five minutes. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, the, the nuclear industry uh, uh, is, uh, I'll be blunt, it has not been a good advocate for itself. Um, and the opponents of nuclear, and I'm, I'm gonna call them out, the Natural Resources Defense Council played a key role in the closure of the, of the Indian Point nuclear plant in New, York, in New York State, in Buchanan. This is ridiculous. If, if we are facing a climate crisis, an existential crisis, the, the Democrats, Republicans, government should be doing all it can to keep these existing nuclear plants open and operating. I make clear in my written testimony, I'd be more inclined to support the electrification of transportation if it was if our grid was more reliant on nuclear instead we're losing our nuclear plants which are it's a travesty what's happening and and and, and mr huffman had you know launched his, his diatribe at me keep diablo canyon open why are you closing that plant why are you allowing the natural resources defense council to to force the state to close that plant it makes no sense it's 10 percent of the state's electricity so uh, i mean th to me this is such an easy decision and yet uh, the states are fumbling it, and Congress is not really doing much to stop it. Yeah, it's an interesting. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's a horrible idea uh, for the state of California. 
uh, I hope that the rest of the country is, is watching and, and not going to repeat that mistake. Um, in, in your testimony, you also highlighted the supply chain problem with electric vehicles. Uh, given the regulatory hostility to mining in the US, a battery-centric energy future virtually guarantees more mining in places like China, Russia, and Congo, countries with horrible human rights records and worse emission standards than the US. China dominates global battery manufacturing, nearly two thirds of all production while fueling 70% of its coal. If China remains the leader in battery manufacturing and we rely on them for supply, is it fair to assume that overhauling our transportation sector with batteries could actually raise carbon emissions in the near term? I think in the global context, sure, that's absolutely a possibility. And I can't give you the carbon balance on batteries and the, the carbon intensity of, of, of battery uh, uh, manufacturing off the top of my head. But I, I just add one quick point is that batteries are kind of like Goldilocks. It can't be too hot, can't be too cold, can't recharge them too fast, you can't discharge them. They, they require very um, uh, tender handling and they're getting better, there's no doubt. But in my view, let let the and I, and Mr. Van Amberg talks about the adoption and in the heavy duty sector. Let those let those those industries lead that adoption. I'm all for it. Let consumers lead the adoption. I, I, there needs to be less government push and more consumer pull. Yeah, no, I I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it, it screams, frankly, as of another way that we need to invest in the American economy. I think the clean energy future creates an enormous set of opportunities on this. I think hopefully everybody agrees um, for our economy, but we have to make the right investments. We have to reshore this mining. We have to make sure that we have the right production and supply chain materials here in the US where feasible. Uh, this will create good paying jobs. It'll make us more resilient uh, and it will do more to reduce climate emissions globally uh, than if we were producing these same things uh, in other countries. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Rep. Naguz for five minutes. You're recognized. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, first and foremost, for holding this very important hearing today. By reducing carbon emissions from the transportation sector, as we've currently heard, uh, or as we've heard today, rather, currently the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States, we can take much needed action to solve the climate crisis. And this is especially timely as the House is considering the Invest in America Act uh, today, which I know some of my colleagues have referenced, which uh, I believe to be bold legislation that will invest in our nation's roads and bridges while preparing our infrastructure for the impacts of climate change. Uh, as we are seeing in my home state of Colorado, highways, transportation, infrastructure are not immune to ultimately the impacts of climate change. Uh, I-70, a major highway through the mountains of Colorado, uh, it is really critical for Colorado residents, tourists, and commercial traffic. Uh, it has seen repeated closures due to mudslides over the burn scar of last year's devastating Grizzly Creek fire. Uh, so we know that smart investments in transportation can reduce our emissions, improve our climate resiliency, and address historic inequities in health and quality of life across communities. Uh, I might also uh, say to my good friend and colleague uh, from uh, the state of North Dakota that uh, our state is also very cold, or can be, and our state also has very long distances. My congressional district is bigger uh, geographically than this entire state of New Jersey. So, uh, but nonetheless, Colorado has made great strides in terms of electrifying its uh, vehicle fleet, uh, and uh, we should be Colorado should be applauded for that. And I know uh, that uh, state leaders look forward to being part of the national conversation as we seek uh, to do so at the federal level. Uh, my questions uh, would be primarily for uh, Commissioner. Uh, Keller, I want to say thank you uh, for your testimony. I appreciate your dedication to reducing emissions, to increasing climate resiliency, and to addressing environmental justices, justice issues rather across the transportation sector. Uh, my district, like many others, faces challenges to our transportation infrastructure because of climate change, in particular from extreme wildfires and the result, a result in increased flood risk in those areas post-fire, as I mentioned, and obviously to the communities that are downstream. Uh, I was interested to read in your written testimony about your work to develop a statewide extreme flood vulnerability analysis tool. And I wonder if you might be able to expound on that a bit further and uh, discuss perhaps how that data will be used to make Minnesota's transportation infrastructure more resilient to climate change and the future flood risk. Representative, this is one of the most important things we can be doing right now to be able to use the data that is available to update that data uh, of Atlas 14 to be able to make sure that the flood measurements that we are using in this data can really help us analyze 
the impact of high water, flood, and debris-related events on bridges, culverts, and pipes across the system, because that is a true vulnerability in what we are facing today. And so we have been working on developing this model. It will be built into our asset management system so that we will know, because we don't have enough money to build new roads in Minnesota. We have barely enough money it, to fix the roads we have. And when we have a catastrophic event, and I think many DOT commissioners across and secretaries across the country would tell you this, they have to go scrambling to find those resources or lean on the federal government. Having this as part of the asset management set would be very important and a very important tool. Well, uh, I certainly agree with you there. I applaud the ingenuity and innovation of, uh, of your team. And uh, my hope is that the tool can be emulated across different states, including my home state of Colorado. Uh, but I know that votes were just called. And so, uh, Madam Chair, I want to be respectful of the time and ensure that uh, any others are able to pose questions as well. So I would thank you again for their testimony and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Rep. Naguz. Next, we'll go to Ranking Member Graves for five minutes. You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, witnesses, I want to thank you all for the testimony. It's been, been very helpful and insightful. Uh, Mr. Bryce, I, I want to ask, looking back um, from 2001 to the current uh, time, the, the trade deficit with China has increased by about 342%. Somewhere over that same time frame, uh, spending for uh, defense within China has increased from a range of 15 to perhaps $18 billion to an excess of $220 billion annually. Um, there, there's been concern expressed here in, in this hearing about our dependence upon OPEC. Um, uh, number one, I, I think the decisions that were made over the last 20 years that, that have moved in, in more of a China direction, I think most of us would now, with the, with the benefit of hindsight, view as flawed decisions. Um, I think that our dependence upon OPEC, many would view as, as flawed decisions. Right now, based at the time that we are at in regard to this evolution of new technology, looking back at this dependence upon China and growing dependence upon them, aren't, are, are we sort of moving in a direction of replacing you know, OPEC with China uh, to some degree if we're not careful about how we move forward on supply chain, keeping in mind also their theft of our intellectual property? Well, yes, uh, Representative, I think that that's, that's certainly w one of the possibilities, and I mentioned that earlier, that um, since 1973, Congress has been promulgated policy after policy aimed at limiting our reliance on foreign supplies of energy. And now we are looking at a, uh, an electric vehicle sector that is going to be almost wholly dependent on China. And to me, it's not necessarily a question of whether they will sell it or is whether there's going to be enough supply because as has been discussed earlier, the limits on mining are real and new mines take a very long time to, to, to develop. And so this idea that we're gonna make some quick and easy transition to electric vehicles, I think it's gonna be a long transition. As I mentioned in, in my written testimony, I, I cited uh, Václav Smil, he says, energy transitions are protracted affairs. And that's just exactly the case. And one last point, the idea electric vehicles are getting better, but the idea that the, the, the internal combustion engines are not standing still. We have the new HCCI engines, the new hybridization of engines, new diesel engine that Toyota uh, announced a few years ago, a 20% increase in efficiency in one iteration. These are remarkable. Uh, it, oil is going to be dominant in transportation for a long time to come. And it's not that, some conspiracy. It's just physics and, and, and basic math. Th thank you, Mr. Bryce. Uh, we, we, you actually introduced a, a topic that I wanted to ask uh, Commissioner Anderson uh, Keller about. So, so according to, um, I think, your Minnesota's DOT, uh, DOT's plan, you, you've uh, launched a project called Pathways to Decarbonizing Transportation. Um, and, and of course, that would be a significant dependence upon electrifying the, 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 the vehicles in, in Minnesota as, as part of that solution. Right now, some of the minerals that are needed uh, for, for that to happen include copper. Uh, current copper reserves um, are, are projected to be depleted in as, as, as few as 14 years from the present. Um, there's a projection that the increased demand in copper could increase by 350% or more. Um, in your own state, 
there, there's a project, uh, Polymet, that, that, that mining operation that's been trying to get underway for 14 years. It's adjacent to two other mining operations. I understand the state Supreme Court approved it, but it, but it looks like there are continued lawsuits and obstacles being thrown in front. Keeping in mind the, the importance of those uh, critical minerals and rare earths for you to, to achieve your plan, is, is that an operation that you support, or how do you suggest we balance that? Well, water is one of the most treasured things representative in Minnesota, and that mine is right along the boundary waters. And so that is, I think, the issue that you see being played out in the courts and the regulatory framework. Our plan actually is not only electrification. It's also biofuels, which helps the ag community can, as can, well. Can I just uh, can I interrupt you real quick? I just, it I, also is... Commissioner, if I could just interrupt you real quick, I just I just want to get clarity. Do, do, so, are you opposed to the mining project because of the threat to the water? Is is that is that y'all's position, Representative? I don't have a position on PolyMet because that is not part of the Department of Transportation. Right. So, I I would like to continue on this for a minute, though. I I just think it's so important. So many people we keep talking about what our goals are. But, but we're not looking at the steps that are needed to actually get there. And, and we can't just suddenly say, hey, we want electric vehicles or uh, we, we want charging stations to pop up. You've got to produce the electricity. You've got to have the manufacturing capacity. I'm, I'm out of time and, and, and I know they have a vote call, so I want to yield back. But I just, it is so important that we think about the execution and how you can possibly do this and do it in a way that's based on America's resources. Yield back. Matt. Madam Chair, if I could, I think it would be I, I'm important sorry, to read the Commissioner, we have a we have a vote. We have a vote, so we're not we're um, we're going to have to uh, uh, move on here. Uh, but I so I'll rec recognize myself for five minutes for questions uh, and just just say that this is really an exciting moment in time because after years of talk about modernizing our transportation systems across the country, our infrastructure. We're actually going to do it this week. The, the House is going to vote on the Invest in America Act uh, that will, at the same time, really help us reduce greenhouse gas pollution that is fueling uh, catastrophic impacts from, from climate change. And at the same time, we're going to create jobs. We're going to fix and modernize uh, our transportation and infrastructure. I mean, this is a win, win, win. Um, and, and we look forward to working with this committee on the solutions for the materials that we're going to need for clean energy. We had a good roundtable uh, about that this month on critical minerals, and I think we'll have more to do in this area. Uh, but there are, a few, there are a few things in our climate, climate crisis action plan where we called on Congress to prioritize maintaining and improving existing highways, and the Invest in America Act does just that. Uh, and I'd like to ask Ms. Osborne, because you've been uh, central to the development of the Invest in America Act all, all along the way. How does the fix it first approach tackle pollution and resilience uh, at the same time? I think folks out there across the country are interested. How are we going to fix our highways and help solve the climate crisis? I appreciate that question. Uh, first off, it focuses on our existing communities and gives us a chance to update the infrastructure where we are so that we can remove barriers to short trips, uh, the ability to cross the street in some place is very difficult, and, uh, and to just allow people to, to walk around their own communities. That alone will have a big impact. It also, in focusing on uh, repairing what we have before we build new, I, I believe that uh, Representative Palmer said there was no money in this bill for uh, additional highways, which is inaccurate. It just says that before you're allowed to build new highways, you have to have a plan for maintaining what you build and you have to make progress on your backlog, which I don't consider to be anything uh, radical. I just question why that hasn't always been uh, the policy. And by doing that and focusing where people are, we're meeting their needs instead of pushing people further away from the things they need, which extends their travel shed, makes them travel more often for more things and further, and with that comes all the emissions. So uh, you know, a focus on a fix it first, other than just being responsible uh, caretaking of the taxpayer dollar, uh, gives us a chance to update the system and ensure we keep 
investing where people are and keeping them closer to the things they need. And Ms. Osborne, you know, small towns, large uh, towns all across America, they are hungry for better connections, safer streets. I mean, in the Tampa Bay area, we have a, an extraordinarily high fatality rate because of bicycle and pedestrians trying to share the road with cars. It's, it's not safe. But this, this is happening all across the country. I know that the Invest in America Act uh, modernizes the federal design standards to support complete streets. Can you help explain what uh, con complete streets are and how they'll make uh, communities all across this country safer? Yeah, the notion of a complete street is one that uh, is designed to accommodate everyone who is allowed to be on it. Again, it's a policy that when you say it out loud, you wonder how that's not already our policy. But right now, you can have a roadway that's open to bicyclists and pedestrians and not provide them any facility to safely use it. Uh, they would have to actually walk in traffic to be able to utilize it. So uh, complete streets is just making sure that there's space and safety for everyone on that roadway. And after what we saw last year with the massive increase in crashes and fatalities, basically as congestion went away, we saw people drive much, much faster uh, which leads to more mistakes and leads to those mistakes being deadly more often. I think we can agree that there is something in those in the design of those roadways that is just out of date with the demands for today. And we care about that in the climate committee because if we can avoid people getting into their cars and instead uh, walking on a safer trail or biking, uh, that cuts pollution. And that is what the name of the game has to be, cutting greenhouse gas pollution if we're going to avoid the, the catastrophic impacts of the climate crisis. Well, I want to, um, I'll complete my questioning here and thank the witnesses for your very insightful testimony. Without objection, we're going to enter a few things into the record. I know, uh, Congresswoman Brownlee, you wanted to offer a, a uh, request. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just, I wanted to, um, enter this report um, uh, into the record showing that California's average electricity bill is lower than half of the states in the United States. Everybody c tends to say California has the highest. Uh, that's not true. Uh, some of the higher states are Connecticut, Florida, what? Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, West Virginia. As a matter of fact, West Virginia is the second, has had the second largest increase in the country in terms of its electricity, um, electricity bill. So if we could insert this into the record. Without objection. Uh, we'll enter that into the record. We're also going to enter into the record at the request of Congress, Congressman Crenshaw, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, final recommendations on Justice 40, climate and economic justice screening tool uh, dated May 21st, 20. 21, and uh, the executive summary of the April 2021 report from the University of California, Berkeley, titled 2035, the report, Transportation, which finds that transitioning to 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2035 will save consumers money, and that we can scale up the EV supply chains and add more clean energy to the grid to make that happen. Uh, I also want to note, so without objection, we'll enter those into the record. I'd also like to note at this time that this is the one-year anniversary of uh, the uh, uh, announcement of our Solving the Climate Crisis Majority Staff Report issued exactly one year ago that made recommendations for uh, action in the Congress to solve the climate crisis, reduce carbon pollution, and make our communities more resilient. Today we're announcing a new tracker so you can track our progress at climatecrisis.house gov slash tracker. I encourage you to do that because we have a whole lot more to do when it comes to clean energy and solving the climate crisis. So without objection, all members will have 10 business days within which to submit additional writ written questions for the witnesses. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Thank you all very much. The committee is adjourned.